Well, hello, and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Join me, Sam Harris, on my journey of curiosity and growth. I have conversations with some of the world's most fascinating humans, from billionaires to Olympians, and most everyone in between, such as suspiciously happy people and even a hitman. Success isn't just for successful people, it is earned and you can earn it too. I find out how ordinary people become extraordinary to fuel your own growth mindset. On the show today, we have Dane Maxwell, who is a serial entrepreneur with many million dollar businesses to his name. He's coached a lot of people as well. And he is also a musician. He's got a few albums out and he is just a really cool guy that's a bit out there. He's, he's also an author. He's, he's written a book, Start From Zero, uh, which is coming out soon. He's got a podcast. So he does a lot of things and he's just a really interesting guy, I guess. He's, he's got some really interesting points of view that get very like meta and out there and he really breaks things down of like how they really work. And I really like the way he explains how businesses work, which, you know, people like might think they understand, but it's actually a very good way to think about this. And I'll let him explain in the podcast rather than me breaking it all down for you now. But essentially, it's a great interview and I hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, Dane Maxwell on the podcast. Welcome to the show. Today we have Dane Maxwell on the podcast. We're going to explore who we each are in the podcast and have a lot of fun. So, Dane, Thank you for coming on and being here at the right time. Can you tell me in three minutes your life story? So thanks for giving me a voice on your show. It's nice to be here. And uh, homeschooled, public school by seventh grade, hid behind a computer, got my hands on business books at around 21. I thought I was going to be an employee. By 28, I had failed 11 times that I can remember, I probably have more. And then ended up with my first million dollar business probably before 30. I started my second million dollar business the next year. And then I've had at least 15 students reach millionaire status in four years time, all starting employees. My students are at the top of their field. They're guys like Sam Ovens, founder of consulting.com, Chandler Bolt, self-publishing school, Carl Mattiola, the number one fastest growing company in the physical therapy space. And I tend to have a knack for the appropriate pattern recognition, both advanced and simple, to rapidly build businesses at light speed, create income streams, create wealth, all starting from zero, all starting from no idea, no money, no experience, which really captures the heart of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneur in their heart can almost never except a circumstance to stop them. And so I think the heart of entrepreneurship, real entrepreneurship is starting from absolute zero. No funding, no idea, uh, no experience. How do you start a business with your back against the wall? How could you start a business sitting at a kitchen table with nothing but a pen and a piece of paper? So my students tend to go on to be the top in their field because somehow working with me has this dramatic impact on the way they think. And also, I tend to attract people that are smart in the first place. So they'd probably be successful without me. They just happen to come along mm. like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's a funny, it's definitely a dual nature of like when you're saying something awesome, but it's like it's the people that pick up on it. Like sometimes I give a speech, but it's the ones that go like, shit, they come and like sort of seek you out and to do more. Like they have the passion to actually drive themselves forwards. So you said you had 11 failures. So you said you just really wanted to build businesses then, just kept on going for it. Can you? Give me an idea of maybe one of the businesses that you started and why, and then why it failed and what you learned. Yeah, absolutely. I can weave it all together. It's just like you get the initial success and then the disillusionment of, wait, this isn't actually making me happy. And that's because our inner identities, working on our identities and achievement doesn't make you happy. So this is what I'm still learning. Identity is like who we think we are. We think we'll be happier when we have money. But what you realize is identity doesn't make you happy because the, the cold truth, which is also very warm, is that we are already happiness. That's who we are. We come in as children. They, what do children usually do? They just do nothing but smile. And then they get conditioning. Then they get trauma. Then they get it. But our natural state is happiness. And when we realize happiness is what we already are, 
And that's who we are on a deep level. And then all this other stuff, we get fixated on pain, fixated on trauma, fixated on growth, fixated on progress, fixated on all these things. And then that hypnotizes us away from what we already are, which is happy in this moment. Even if you're sad, if you fully accept that sadness, there's kind of a happiness. There's like a relaxation to it. Like, you know, when you're sad, but you're fully in it, it's like not that bad. So there's this, like, what we actually are is this, like, indestructible happiness that can actually hold everything. So when you move your identification to this, and as I've been moving my identification to living from what I actually authentically am, from what I can sense right now is just to build these massively impactful businesses, but not really businesses. Like, it feels more like spiritual work to me. And from a, such a deep place of service and such a deep place of love that I operate from with my businesses that I listen so deeply to the customers that I'm serving and create things that are quote innovative or quote better or quote disruptive, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to look at competition. I'm not trying to maximize profitability as intentions. Those things are all ancillary secondary after the deep love I have for humanity the deep love I have for a fellow human being and my fundamental business knowledge, which I feel like is a gift given to me. Like some people are gifted at violin at by age 12. I happen to be gifted at music and also business. But business is this like weird acumen that if I read a business book, like I get it the first time I read it. The words like pop off the page and like implant in my brain and go deep in my soul or something as I read it. And I'm like, I know this stuff. And then like I read it and then I have it. It's like a photographic memory. So anyway, I feel like I was given a gift to give to the world, which is how to understand business and move from a really deep place of spiritual love and also get really rich. I absolutely love money. And when I say I love money, it means I'm really okay if it comes and I'm really okay if it goes. That's real love. I'm not attached to money. I love money. And I had to do work on self-image and self-esteem to do that. So what I do that I think is so unique in business is I blend self-image, I blend identity, I blend feelings, and I blend it with grounded business fundamentals. Because to do self-image work or emotional work, you've got to use pattern recognition for that. Oh, I've got this feeling I'm afraid to talk to this client because I'm afraid of rejection. All right, great. So the feeling is a fear of rejection. Where else does that same pattern of fear? Oh, every time I talk to a beautiful woman. Okay, great. So every time I feel like I'm about to risk my heart, there's a fear of rejection. Now I just use pattern recognition to diagnose my issue. And now that I see that the pattern is not just isolated to talking to a client, there's this immense freedom. But then also there's this knowing that there's a deeper identity of who I believe I am that is actually producing the fear of rejection. And at this point, now I know that identity is the heart. And if I work with identity, because identity is producing the fear of rejection. Because if I have the identity of a potent and powerful alpha male, and not alpha like I get the girl and slay the dudes, I mean like alpha male, like provider and protector. The real alphas of tribes are like very humble and very protective of their, their families. And man, I get emotional when I say that because, you know, we're portrayed alpha males, you know, six pack. German guy with tall, blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, big broad shoulder. Like that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the heart is to pr protect and provide. So if you have the identity of potent and powerful protector and provider, you're probably not going to have a feeling of a fear of rejection come up. You're probably going to have an excitement to connect with someone. And if they don't like you, maybe you're sad but not because it means anything about you. You're sad because you've lost the connection. So in those 11 businesses, man, I started one just for fun so I could document it like a month or two ago. And that business was a follow-up system for massage therapists. The 11 businesses I started that all failed, they were all my idea. So it's like, you know, online guitar video lessons. I'm passionate about guitar and video. I should do that. <laughs> okay, great. Start your passion. That works all the time, doesn't it? No. No, because so in my book that's coming out, I never really wanted to write a book. But then I had a publisher contact me. They're like, hey, do you want to write a book or whatever? I was like, you know, I actually really do. So times change. And so I put 16 years of business experience. And after training thousands of entrepreneurs, I put all this research into a book that I wrote over two years. In that book, and it's, I think it's going to be one of the best books 
that someone could read if they really want to start something. It's called Start From Zero. But in the book, there's seven different learning adventures that you go on. Seven different adventures. And the first adventure is learning something called the three little rocks. The first rock and the second rock and the third rock. So to save time, just on the second rock, that is the cardinal rule of successful entrepreneurship. You want to start a business? You come to me and sit in front of me like, Dane, I want to start a business. It's like, well, usually it's not quite the business. You know, maybe you want to spend more time with your kids or you know, you want to travel, et cetera. Or maybe you just love business. You love finding problems. You love solving them. You love putting customer acquisition systems in place because you know that will create legacy level wealth for your family and generations. Like business is the place where you get nasty rich. Business is the place where you get absolutely crazy wealthy. That's where the richest men in the world that have and own and create their own businesses. So like if you want to create legacy level wealth and just like, like snap your finger and get your 16 year old kid a Lambo one day, you would probably want to spoil your kid with something like that. But like if you wanted to have that kind of option, the cardinal rule of successful entrepreneurship is that we do not get to decide what works. We don't get to decide what people like. We don't get to decide what people buy. So that means that we've, we must fervently and deeply listen to them. So the first 11 ideas that failed, they were all my idea, all of them. So what I did is I ended up started listening to people. But the, the whole meantime, the reason that I became successful rapidly is because I made a fool of myself often. I failed often. I looked stupid often. And I did difficult things often. And I continued to reflect. I built a software product for a contact database for realtors. I was talking to a realtor at a bar and she's like, I was like, so how do you handle your contact? She's like, well, I use a piece of paper and I keep it in my car. And I'm like, well, do you ever lose that piece of paper in your car? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, do you think you ever lose a deal because of that? Yes. How much does a lost deal cost you? Oh, three to four grand. So do you, how many times have you lost three to four grand? Oh, I don't know. It's like, well, I've got this thing that's pretty much a yellow legal pad. You just use your phone. And you can type the stuff in, you can store your contacts. Do you think that'd be good? She's like, well, you know, how much is it? I'm like, oh, this is $9 a month. She's like, no, I'm not interested. And I was like, you mother, oh my God, I hated her. Because I had already built this product. And it was already built. So she, had, she needed to buy it. She had to buy it. In that same breath, within like minutes, she was, uh, or maybe even just later in the night, I saw her, it was pretty close, pretty, they were pretty close. Her bill came for alcohol and I saw it was like, you know, $80 or $75, $80 on alcohol. And I was like, she's literally buying $80 in alcohol, but she won't spend $9 a month, which is like $84 a year to potentially save three and $4,000 deals. This woman is stupid. Okay. Is she, or am I stupid? You know what? We don't get to decide what works. So until you get this beat in your brain, like I did. Like everybody gets their teeth kicked in. Everybody pays tuition. You cannot avoid getting your heart broken. You cannot avoid failure in business. You cannot avoid getting your teeth kicked in. There's no way around it. So that's why it's super important to know who you are on a thought level. And then also know who you are on an experiential level. Because if what you think about yourself is far more important than anything else in the world, like what you think about yourself, because if you think you're weak or pathetic or impotent, you'll probably seek my approval or Sam's approval, or you seek the approval of a customer. And then you'll totally just suffocate, drown and cripple your potential. But if you think you're a beautiful, loving and kind and caring human being, if that's who you thought you are on a deep level, you would go beyond looking for my and Sam's approval you'd probably think about what are the struggles that Sam and I are going through. You'd probably, you'd probably say like, you know what I really want? I just really want Sam and Dane to be happy and I want them to have a great life. And so I want to talk to them and see how I might be able to serve them. That how you think of yourself is so, so paramount. And I don't hear any entrepreneur people talking on this, there are some that will say, let's create, let's, let's consciously create an identity for you. But if you consciously create an identity, that's still very limiting because we're way more than identity. And also you can create this identity of someone wearing suits and, you know, a, a watch and, or you could create an identity of a musician and you could step into that. But what you, what you don't know is you're building your foundation on something that's not actually fully accurate because you could live into that identity. But what you'll find is identities don't make you happy. So like you had, Sam, you built yourself into this successful money-making person. 
but then you realize you weren't happy because I think this is sort of the next frontier of human evolution is recognizing that we already are happiness. And then from that place, we can exercise and express our gift in the world. The Jedi move with this then, Sam, is since you already recognize that deep down you are happiness, that means that you can actually hold anything else that's coming up. So if you believe that you're worthless, I have some of the most wonderful news because I, I believe that. I think I even can feel that right now. The thing is, even though I, part of me is believing that I'm worthless, I recognize that as only a thought. And that is mind blowing. Like, wait, whoa, I'm not actually worthless. Like, and this is something I deeply struggle with, you know, physical abuse and trauma and enough cute girls rejecting me and no parents really telling me that it was about them and not about me. I started developing this identity of worthless freak makes women uncomfortable, like, you know, (laughs) all these terrible things. And then I realized they're literally only a thought and they can be held, not rejected, not dismissed. This is literally blowing my mind. Like, so if I believe that I'm worthless and it's not conscious, there are parts of me that probably still believe I'm worthless that are, I know there are, that are unconscious, that I'm trying to go out and try and fix and correct and become worthy. And so what happens though, is there's a place of happiness that we actually are, a place of infinite potential that we actually are, that is so far beyond any explanation of worthlessness or worthiness that like, I've popped into this space before. And when I'm in that space, I can think about being worthy from that space. Even that's limiting. Like being worthy is actually a limiting experience. Like he's like, I just want to be worthy. I just want to be potent. I just want to be powerful. There's a space beyond that because it's beyond description. It's a word called ineffable, which is, I had to look up what's beyond description, ineffability. Like my love for you is ineffable, like kind of a thing. Like the, my happiness is ineffable. It's, it's like beyond description. So literally recognizing that who we actually are is the space of pure happiness and pure peace. And that happiness can hold immense suffering without rejecting it because it knows the suffering's there. It trusts the suffering will pass, but it doesn't get identified with it. And if it does, it holds that identification. There's two schools of thought with this. Let's say you're believing you're worthless or you're believing you're ugly or you're believing you're worthy. Recognizing that all of those are identity and none of those are actually who you even are because they're only thoughts. So even you believe that you're worthy is a thought. Who's the person that's recognizing that you're worthy? You're it's way, way beyond. So it's, a, it's an all-inclusive holding of your human experience. All thoughts, all emotion, all feeling. Because if we can become extremely comfortable with feeling hideous, and we can become extremely comfortable with feeling handsome or beautiful, and if we can become extremely comfortable with feeling ashamed, and also extremely comfortable with feeling sexy, then there's no emotional experience that we can't hold. If shame comes rushing in, you won't be buckled by it. And if you are, then that's just more work to do because there's certain things I could definitely be ashamed of. And what I would do in that is I would hold it, I'd feel it, I'd let it come through my throat, I'd start weeping, I'd let it be there, I'd befriend that shame. And as I befriend that shame and as it becomes okay, And when you can do this, you are virtually unstoppable. Yeah. Do you much like Buddhism or meditation, Vipassana kind of things? It relates quite a lot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Building metacognition to hold hold experience. Yeah. Cool. Deep. Did you always talk a lot or did that kind of come as you suddenly realized you had lots to say? I don't know. (laughs) What do you, what do you mean? Well, as in, you kind of start saying things and you get on like a proper role of like, oh my God, and there's other thing and there's other thing you need to know. And like, it's sort of, it's coming thick and fast. And as an interview, I don't have that much to do. It's quite nice. But I, just because of, we have quite a similar story so far, I didn't used to talk very much, but lately I have started being told like, Sam, you do talk a lot sometimes. And I'm like, what? That's not my identity because of, I've been so used to being like, Sam, you never speak. Why don't you speak, Sam? And it's kind of weird. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh, I have lots to say now, I guess. It's kind of odd. What I think happens is like, uh, so I I can feel your heart. I can, I have, but, but it's, I don't know if it's actually yours cause it's my identity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. But I, I feel a receptivity and that's rare. Even if I say, Hey, you could start a million dollar business 
and if the person's like an average proper employee, they'll not be receptive to that. Having receptivity is very rare. So anyway, when I feel receptivity, it opens up different aspects of my being to come forward and, and speak. So nice way of saying it. Cool. Anyway, so like I don't see why you necessarily failed at doing guitar teaching because there are people who do make a good business out of running guitar teaching online and things. And you seem like you're already switched on and you could like look at what those people were doing and could just re- replicate that or do a better job of it. So uh, I'm kind of interested to see why that failed. I sucked at business. That was my first one. I did some cool stuff. I mean, I had, I had some sales, but I didn't have a clear customer defined. The approach or the mechanism that I was using to deliver the result was amazing. It was life changing for people. The approach and the product was really great, but it all failed because I didn't really understand business. You know, it wasn't because it was guitar video lessons. It was because I sucked at business. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, writing, what kind of process have you been following for writing? Do you kind of wake up and just do two hours every day? Or is it kind of once a month you'd have an idea and just go work on it for a weekend? It's very painful because I could have something that thinks that I think is the coolest thing in the world and I write it and then I share it to someone. They're like, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like, like I'm not, I, I, I literally can't wrap my head around what you're saying. Like, dude, this is the coolest thing in the world. What are you talking about? So my first editor was like, the book's good, but it's not that great. And I was like, damn. So I went back and I looked at it and read it. I'm like, she's right. So I rewrote it and then I rewrote it and then I re-edited it. And then I went through five editors. And by the time we got to the fifth editor, they're like, this is a great book. You know, so the book started, I'm going to write a book. And it's evolved now into seven learning adventures, three rocks, four brains you build, the skills you don't need, the skills you do need, the top five personality traits that we've collected through data that will ensure your success, the bottom five traits you don't want to have that will hamper your success, 15 different success stories of students who went from employee to entrepreneur, 15, you will not be able to believe in scarcity. Each one of the 15 examples has a full personality profile next to their success stories. You'll see a 26 factor analysis of their personality and actually see what really goes on underneath the hood of an entrepreneur's mind on a personality front. There's four growth levels that we've defined from entrepreneurship, from beginner to minor to major to all-star, from how the beginner orients their identity to how the all-star orients their identity. It's a dope book. I'm pretty excited now. (laughs) Thanks, man. I didn't start like that. That was five edits. I had some core key ideas, but I just had to keep hacking away at it until it shone gold. Yeah, yeah. I'm writing at the moment and I sort of had like an initial easy plan and I just keep on getting off and making things really hard for myself and going like kind of mental loops of like, whoa, but if you think about it like this and then from this and then then just like, oh God, Sam, just like, just write the simple thing. But I can't like... (laughs) The way I do that is I think about a customer that I'm writing to because I've lost a lot of money by overestimating the intelligence of my customers. Like they would actually pay for way simpler stuff than what I think about. Like I overestimate their intelligence. Like, all right, guys, here's what you do. You're going to find this idea. You're going to create this video course. You're going to create a video sales letter. You're going to do all this. You're going to do it. And they're going to be like, not maybe literally, but this has happened before. Wait, but how do I buy a domain name? Can you teach me that? And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, that's what, shit, I'm being arrogant. Yeah. So here's yeah. how you buy a domain. Go to name.com, click this, buy it. When you buy it, it's now going to be in your account. It's going to be like a virtual piece of real estate. Then you can actually direct <laughs> that virtual piece of real estate to go anywhere you want. And here's how it all works. And like someone finds a lot of value in that, but I overestimate intelligence. So when you're writing your book, make sure you're writing it to someone. And then if you're writing it to that one person, that really takes the cake. I've got a blog post that I'm writing right now, and I'm really excited about it. It's called How to Make $1,000 in 24 Hours by actually really helping someone. Like Because there's so much crap on the internet that's like, here's how to make money online. And then it's like, put all these puzzle pieces in place and you'll make money. And it's like, fuck that. Are you fucking kidding me? That has nothing to do with helping someone. If you focus on loving the person you're working with and like you feel beautiful as a person inside and you feel like 
you really care about that person and you're actually loving them and you put the person first, you will build one of the most innovative, wonderful businesses and products you could ever imagine because you're obsessed with the person that will be using the thing that you're going to be building something for. And so if you make that first and then you can think about the puzzle, then you can put your selfish agendas next. Put your selfish agenda is like, how, what kind of business model? Do you want to work nine to five? Do you want to not work weekends? Do you only want to work two hours a day? Do you want to make 20 grand a month? You can define all those things. But in your orientation of your mind, like in your heart, you want to absolutely obsess about the person you're serving. Mm-hmm. And so this blog post, you know, how to make $1,000 in 24 hours, we break down business into a very fundamentally simple thing, which is a very clear customer and a very clear result and a very clear mechanism. That's business. Don't need to complicate it any more than that. There's a clear customer that wants a clear result, so we use a clear mechanism. So maybe people that are like 55 years old, they have a a car accident, and the result they want is to have no more pain in their back when they sit in their car. So the mechanism could be physical therapy. The mechanism could be, God forbid, surgery. The mechanism could be some sort of pill. The mechanism could be a personal trainer. The mechanism could be a number of things. But if you've got clear customer and clear result defined and you care about both of those, you outsource mechanisms. So because what happens is business is ass backwards everywhere. And we have all these technicians and all these experts trying to start businesses based on what they want and their passion and their creativity. And well, I'm good at writing, so I could do a course on writing and I'm good at this. And it's like, that's so narcissistic. And it's okay because it's misinformed. So it's not necessarily narcissism. I could be a little kinder. It's just misinformed. Real value in a business is centered around the customer. It's not centered around you. So that is a fundamental transformation and innovation in how most people do entrepreneurship. It's not how the smart guys do it, but how most people do it. Elon Musk isn't making his cars. Jeff Bezos isn't working on his servers. They're focused on customers and results and they build teams to build mechanisms. This is real entrepreneurship to me. Entrepreneurs trade time for freedom. Technicians trade time for money. Entrepreneurs trade time for equity. Technicians trade time for money. If you trade time for equity, that means you have to stop being an expert at the craft. That means you hire experts to build products. So I do this now. I find customers, I find results, I hire out mechanism. My dad's an optometrist. So let's say person in their 60s, result is they want to see clearly. They could do contacts. They could do glasses. They could do LASIK surgery. Those are the three things I know of. But those are three mechanisms because they want to see 20-20 vision. They don't care how they get there. Most of them don't even want to wear glasses. Most of them don't want to wear contacts. The biggest problem my dad has is people just leave their contacts in all the time and they're ruining their eyes because they're literally abusing the mechanism of the contact. And he's like, this is ruining your eye. By the time you're older, you won't be able to wear contacts. You'll only be able to wear glasses. Your eyes will atrophy potentially. If I'm understanding that correctly, he may have different words on this, but clear customer, clear result, clear mechanism. So how to make a thousand dollars in 24 hours is clear customer. I chose massage therapists, clear result, consistent returning patients that they don't have to advertise for. So clear mechanism to do that is to stay in great touch with their current contact list. If they nurture and stay in touch with their current list of customers and send them messages regularly, they can have a returning client base. So our mechanism is going to be a client follow-up list. I'm hearing like the advice you're giving and thinking about how it works for me. And yeah, I also like you're explaining style. It, it does kind of just like remind me a lot of myself is that I don't just sort of, I can't write short blog posts where you don't get something really useful out of it as in it just shows that you're smart. And it doesn't like, it's just like, it's like saying a smart quote or something like it's yeah. smart, but like you don't remember it. You can't do anything with it. It's sort of, you have to like tell the full story and really go into it and like unpack everything. I can't, I'm not very good at just doing the simple, easy thing. I have to kind of really overthink it and do lots of stuff around it. And like, I don't like fooling people into think that I'm helping them when I'm not. And like, I really hate oh, like, talking about like all the people that sort of like sell stuff to people and you're just like, ah, oh, but like, it's just, Selling things to stupid people who can't quite work out what it is they, they've been doing. And you're like, that's so annoying. Yeah. So it's been really nice listening to you and be like, it's quite motivating to see that I can go in that direction more and <laughs> hopefully become like a millionaire, but whilst having fun and doing cool stuff that helps people. So it's been very nice to listen to all the things that you're saying. And certainly just like the clarity that you've had from like the years of experience of like trying to explain this to people. Because it's stuff you can kind of understand, but then like you understand it better when you can explain it really nicely to people so that they get it. So it's just nice to hear the examples that you've been, been giving for sure. Um, I, hope, I hope that entrepreneurship seems like a possibility for many more people than it currently does. Yeah. Mm, big time. 
on the whole growth mindset side of things. So yeah, you definitely got a good mindset around these things to break stuff down and kind of challenge yourself, which is nice to go into. So uh, what are you best in the world at? Because you've alluded to a lot of things that you seem to think quite highly of yourself in. But I wouldn't be able to say what I think. Or maybe I should try and predict what you're best in the world at. It could be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're really good at taking a step back from what your initial thought is to see what like the real truth is behind something. Yeah. Other than just running with like, because they say go with your gut, but like it's not always that useful. It's like there is other things going on behind everything. So I think you're very good at that. I don't know if it's the best thing you're at in the world, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that prediction. Yeah, hey, best in the world. It, it's a it's a fun question because it it requires like full self honesty to the best of your ability. You can imagine like Rock John Rockefeller when he's running his oil empire and he had these like chalkboards in his wall in his room about the price per gallon of oil. Like, could you imagine if he went with his gut instead of numbers? He would be screwed. Mm. He would be screwed. There'd be no way. You know, go with your gut on a niche or experiment with five. So I'd, I'd say experimentation, I'm, I'm quite good at. In terms of probably best in the world at, what I seem to excel at is being able to help people no matter where they're at, find out where to go and what to do that's congruent for them. I seem to be really, really good at that because I'm extremely sensitive to energetics. And so I can tune into someone and if they'll allow, like violating boundaries or anything, I'll tune in with them and I can help them articulate the subtle aspects of their heart that would allow them to start taking the first steps toward the thing that matters to them most. Yeah, I would say I'm good at business because the way I think about it and what I experiment with. Nice. And I think one of the smartest things you can do is realizing that you're not actually the the most smart human ever or that just humans as a general species are pretty not smart and that you're kind of limited by the fact that you are a human is really useful. What is one of your earliest ever memories? There's ones I'm told and ones I actually remember. Mm. God, one know. that's like a good story and makes you feel something oh sure i was i had a huge crush on this girl seventh grade her name was tiffany Mm-mm-mm. and i could never talk to her and she'd sit in front of me in class and she'd flick her hair back every once in a while and her hair would touch my hands and i'm like oh my god she likes me this is amazing um seventh grade crush and i could never talk to her and we were singing like chorus or something like a group course and my dad had the camera and I kept going like this to get him to move the camera over to get video of her so I could look at her because there's no Facebook you know like I I'd go back and I'd hit play and I just watch her face on the camera and she was just so cute I never asked her out because I thought I was worthless and to women really like truly like legitimately like women wouldn't want to touch me they would get no pleasure from kissing me etc so I never talked to her fast forward to me being 28 years old and single and she's married and has two kids we're out at we were me and my friends are all out at the bar and that was the time when i frequented the bars and i saw her and i was instantly overtaken with again my obsession with this mm-hmm. one and she had children she had had some like baby weight she wasn't the same shining seventh grader duh but I didn't give, I, I was like, she is the hot. She's so hot. I think she's, and like my, but my friends are like, dude, Dane, like, she's not what you're saying. I'm like, yes, yeah, she is. She's amazing. And so I went and I took her out on the dance floor. I like, I found her and I was like, let dance, come dance with me. And we danced. And like, we're dancing passionately. And I didn't care that she was married because I'd been drinking. I was 28. I would not do that today. While I was drinking, I said, I had such a crush on you in high school. And she's like, I thought you were totally cute. I would have gone out with you if you asked me. And I was like, run away with me now. And she says, no, I've, I've got, I'm married and I have kids. Like, it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I just caught him, caught him in the hopeless romance of the moment. And uh, yeah, anyway, she would have said yes, had I asked. And it's a good thing that she didn't, because I think that was a very different version of me. And the woman I'm with now is a very good match intellectually and 
um, spiritually and it's a good connection. It's, it's a good thing. And think about like, if you get to the end of your life, all the things you thought about doing, but didn't do because you didn't think they'd work out mm-hmm. and then be shown at the end of your life that they would have all worked out and that you've always been worthy and adequate and significant. And to think about like, if you were shown that at 60, all the things you could have done, you know, I'm looking to take a lot more risks now, you know, cause I got very successful by 30 and then I shielded off my heart to protect my heart and I stopped taking risks. And so I did okay. I did well, but I didn't rapidly move forward with an accelerated pace. So since I've realized that I stopped taking risks, I'm now taking quite a few more risks in my life and trying to look like a fool more often than I used to. And so anyway, yeah, I think it's really important to really like legitimately take something that feels like a risk to you. This is one of those moments you better understand yourself when you start feeling this like kind of fear or notice that in, in you, can, you should get excited and like, oh, there's this thing that I'm kind of, kind of scared of. It's an opportunity to go and do this thing that like I probably wouldn't have done before. You kind of recognize it as like a really cool thing that you want to like be like, yes, this is the shiny thing that's probably where the best thing's at. That's great. I think what I would advise folks is like, go to the thing that you're completely debilitated by and paralyzed by and without trying to change the feeling with your mind, just make a new decision and take action while you're feeling that paralysis. Like you're wanting the situation to be better. You're wanting the paralysis to go away, et cetera. But like go to the thing that paralyzes you the most and make that new decision. It would be like, it's like difficult and impossible. It's like, imagine yourself doing a handstand. You're like, what? I could not do a freaking handstand. Well, you're not going to go do that without support. Like the impossibility of doing a handstand. Like there's just no belief in your brain. Like I'm not someone that can do a handstand. Like that, that kind of a thought, like, that kind of experience with some support, you would do one of those, but find that thing that you're debilitated by and use the power of your mind to connect and through that experience and make a new decision and know that it will be absolutely difficult. That's what I'd recommend in terms of like a risk. That's what I would, if you did that, you know, cause I, I with music, I, I got quite good at it to my own accord. I, re- I released my third album and it's, it's, I'm really proud of it. And one of the things I want to do is master a loop pedal, but a loop pedal just slayed me. Like I was like, I cannot touch a loop pedal. They're just, I, it crumbles me. Like I would, I, I couldn't even plug it in and put the cords in without just like, <sighs> <sighs> so I'd like just, just what I could and then lay on the bed and then come back and then put loops together, you know, and then, then I get loops together and then I keep going and then I start putting songs together and then I work on my voice and I've, Got kind of like an Irish tenor sound that I worked really hard wow. on, you know, and and I and I just I just love how I sing, you know, when the night comes, and that would be like a sound I'd try to make pretty, and then if I was just being reckless, I'd say when the night comes, mm. and I and I'd go fuller, you know, and then you know when the night comes, that's a voice that I worked four years on with top vocal trainers to be able to do. That's not like an innate thing. That's something I worked really hard on. But the loop pedal just slayed the crap out of me. Like it just impo- And now I can just get on there and lay a chord track down and do some solos around it and then beat my guitar a little bit to put a little bass, a little uh, rhythm in there. That's a great risk. So I think there are things where you think you're being vulnerable. Like if I talk about worthlessness, to some people that'd be really vulnerable. To me, it's not anymore because I'm so comfortable working in that space. To me, what's vulnerable is saying that I feel handsome. That's way more vulnerable. And that's not even about look. That's just, I say, I feel handsome. That feels more uncertain, more risky. So if you can actually track what would be vulnerable for you to do, that's also like a very good, very good way um, to do it. Like something vulnerable that I could say right now where I feel my stomach churn is I'd say, you know, Sam, I, I hope you like me. I, I've had a really good time <laughs> on this on this show, and I I hope you like me. And you don't have to say you do or not, because that's my shit. But that's because I don't want to hear. You know, mm-hmm. it's but, you know, you say no, and I'm like, well, oh, fuck, that sucks. You know, and you say yes, and I'm like, whoa, that's wild. But that would be an example of something vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good example. Good. Just backtracking a bit. I've been working on my voice, and I've just got a loop pedal for Christmas, <laughs> and then, and oh my god, this thing's a nightmare. But uh, it's a lot of fun when you uh, sometimes get things right. So I need to do a little more practice on that. Oh, yeah, yeah. My, that's the exact one that my dad has. I've been 
been using his a lot, but my one's not quite as good. But I figured I'd work up to it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I, I, think I, think I, I back one. I think I got a little too advanced too quick, but yeah, as in I tried to like force myself to like, as in like when I first started guitar, I got like a crappy acoustic and was like, once I can actually sort of do some like good things on it now, get myself a nice one kind of thing. So I do the same thing with looper pedals. Anyway, on the vulnerability side of things, I kind of wanted to say, yeah, I also hope that you like me and I kind of feel a bit sorry even if I came across a bit rude initially. I think I kind of just came from like a genuine point of just how I was feeling in general rather than like an attack on you on being like, oh, why do I have all these like random people I don't know like coming on my podcast? But didn't want to come across kind of like, I'm only saying that now because of I feel like I've found value in you. As in like, I didn't want to be coming across badly in the first place and whether or not like what you then went and did was not so important it was more like how i show up anyway so it's more right about that rather i would just want to if i could plug my book before i forget yeah you've mentioned it but uh, the yeah the book this time really good so i'm excited for it yeah start from zero.com forward slash growth will be a special url for your for your podcast Cool. Uh, Starfruitshow.com forces growth. And I, I don't want you to buy the book unless you really want to read it. Um, I, like if you don't buy a book and put it on a shelf, I really want you to read this book. I don't want the most sold book. I want the most read book. So if you do start from zero.com forward slash growth, it'll take you to a page where you can get a book excerpt. It's a really good part of the book. Um, and if you like that, then maybe pick the rest of it up. And you can get that book excerpt without even having to put your email in. There's no email capture required. Just starvezero.com forward slash growth. And then also I've got a podcast where I mentor people straight up how to make money based on their situation. So I got like an 80 year old comes on. I tell them what to do. A person who's got a yoga certification, I tell them what to do. So you can hear me teach people how to make money over and over and over again without compromising who they are. But if you just do start from zero.com forward slash growth, you can check out the book excerpt, check out the podcast. I'd love to start a relationship with any of you that feel called to do that. And that's it. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. If you could say the kindest thing that someone's done for you in one minute, that would be good. Just because that's the question I always ask people. The kindest thing anyone ever did for me was my uncle helped me get started in business by giving me my first paying customer. He gave me a referral. And then I came back to him for my next paying customer. And he said, no. <laughs> And he gave me a, a list of phone numbers to start cold calling. He said, you get your next customer on your own. That was the beginning of looking like a fool every day for an hour, hour and a half. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, man. In terms of your podcast, I'm starting a business idea. Would that be the kind of thing I could turn up on your podcast for? Or is it more for people that have never, ever run a business? No, that would work. That would work fine. If you list, just listen to a few of them. Yeah. If you think that you would be good on it, just let me know. Sure. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, dude. Uh, I'm happy to happy to help. I'm, I'm glad to know you. Yeah, me too. As in to know you as well as knowing myself. Glad for both things. Cool. Cheers. Later, bro. Ciao. Well, that was a very insightful interview that went in some directions I was not expecting. I certainly really like his general philosophy of how a business works. You, know, you have a customer, a problem, and a mechanism to solve it. And it really does make you think quite clearly about what it is you're going to do with your business and how you're going to get there to whatever it is that you want to be getting to. So I really like that point from him. And then, yeah, it's just been interesting how he's been doing it with other people. And it's just really interesting to meet people that seem to be, like, it, it was almost a bit freaky, like how many things he's done just like me. Sort of seem a bit like he's doing my life story for me, but he's just a bit further ahead. And it's kind of weird to say, because as well as all the different things he's done in business. Like I've also been working a lot on music myself and I've been doing a lot of singing over the last year and I'm in a choir and I've been performing and things and it's like, what, this guy? <laughs> so I, I want to write an album uh, when I'm 30, which is uh, next year. And yeah, he's done four now because he's you know, six years ahead of me. And it's just a bit like, what, this guy's just doing all the same things as me. So hopefully I'll be um, another millionaire with all my different business ideas that have taken off. We shall see. Really like his mindful approach. He's just very good at stepping back and asking why and how things work. And it doesn't seem to be a big into meditation, but it's just a very mindful way of doing things when you think about what's actually going on in your brain and what's the point of doing the things that you're doing. So it was just really nice to see someone that's kind of out there and thinking about things and understanding the problems that they're having and why things aren't working and how to make yourself understandable. Because that's something that is something that I struggled with as well, as in had lots of really complicated things going on in my brain that I just 
didn't do a good job of explaining to other people, which is one of the things that I've been doing this podcast for is to get better at speaking and being understandable to others. And it sounds like he's further ahead on that journey than me as well. Anyway, great to have him on the podcast. I hope you learned from it as well. His book sounds really good. I'm actually kind of excited to read it. So yeah, pick that up in March, which it probably will be by the time you listen to this. All right. Have a nice day, everybody. Congratulations on listening to a whole episode of the Growth Mindset Podcast. Before you race into another podcast, try pausing. Ask yourself, what have you learned? What could you change? How will you make that change happen? Did you press pause? Knowledge is useless without action. What did you learn? What should you change? And how will you make that change happen? You can tell us what you learned by contacting us through the website, growthmindsetpodcast.com. And feel free to connect with us or our guests, or just peruse the show notes. Our Instagram is at growthmindsetpodcast, or follow me at samjamsnaps for a daily reminder to stop using Instagram. If you enjoy random acts of kindness and want to support the show, you can support us on Patreon or leave us a review on iTunes, and you'll make me very happy. And with that, keep learning and keep growing.